Well, hello and welcome to Rare Classic Cars. This is Adam from the porch. Today I thought I would do something for the Ford lovers. We've talked about the Caprice in the last video vignette, but let's talk about something that I guess every Ford uh, lover will recognize and even beyond the Ford lovers. We'll talk about the origins of the Mercury Marquis and the Grand Marquis. Now, in spite of what those words conjure up in your mind, that was not how the vehicle started. It was not grandma's grocery getter. Uh, it was a significantly different range topping vehicle when it first came out in 1967. So let's explore a bit more about the origins of the Marquis and Grand Marquis and talk about the ownership experiences. I have more than a few and I hope you enjoy this video vignette segment. Thanks for watching. Long before it conjured up images of grandmothers with blue hair dye streaking down their face like Rudy Giuliani at a press conference, or perfume that was a wonderful melange of roses, dishwater, and misty socks, the Mercury Marquis was a range-topping coupe introduced by Mercury in 1967. Whereas in previous years, the range topper for 1966, as an example, was the Park Lane Convertible Coupe, 1967 saw the marquee launched with a base price of $3,989, which actually was $5 more than the base price of the Park Lane Convertible in the same year and Mercury's most expensive vehicle. This was also the year in which Mercury pivoted from having the ad campaign move ahead in the Lincoln Continental tradition to something that would assuredly not be allowed in today's environment, and that was Mercury, the man's car. Yes, that's right, the man's car. Ads for the marquee as well as other Mercury's extolled the kind of car that every man promises himself someday. And with a car that was just as comfortable as every man's club. Yes, even in the chauvinistic late 60s, it's hard to believe that an ad campaign was so overt, but it was. Notably, in 1968, Mercury reverted back to trying to explain its proximity in the lineup versus the Lincoln Continental, perhaps because the man's car did not quite resonate as well as Mercury had hoped. Part of this may have been due to the lofty base price of the marquee, which is mentioned at $3,989, placed it significantly ahead of a 1967 Buick Wildcat Custom Coupe, whose base price was just $3,603, or about $386 less than the Mercury. Also, a 1967 Buick Electra Coupe was $4,075, less than $100 more. So this marquee was slotted right up against the top of GM's near luxury segment. And I must say the 67 Buick Wildcat Custom Coupe, for those who haven't seen one, is a mighty handsome car. For this base price, the brochures extolled the virtues of the marquee's deep padded box pleats in a styling treatment that says plush distinction. And plush it was indeed. These seats, as you can see here in the photo, were extremely comfortable. They were what Mercury called twin comfort lounge seats so they could be operated independently because, as another ad said, a man has legs and needs his space. But in all truth, the, ex the interiors were very well trimmed, very comfortable, and quite high-end, particularly for a mid-level or near-luxury car. Under the Marquis' hood rested a 410 cubic inch V8 that was exclusive to Mercury and only used for two years, 1966 and 1967. It shared the 390's bore but employed a crankshaft from a 428 elongating the stroke, hence the 410 cubic inch displacement that was about midway between the 390 and 428 cubic inch V8's. This engine is a particularly smooth runner, However, it is topped off with the worst year and the first year of Ford's Autolite or Motorcraft 4300 carburetor, which can prove relatively problematic if you don't know how to work out its little kinks and quirks. As far as quote-unquote luxury features were concerned, and aside from the Epicurean interior, the marquee did come standard with power steering and power brakes, 
which were, I suppose, a luxury of the time. And the power brakes were, interestingly, fixed caliper four-piston brakes. That's right, four-piston brakes, which would go away with the 1968 model year when the marquee subsequently used single-piston floating caliper brakes. Customers could choose from myriad options, including AM, FM, stereo radio, radios, power antennas, power seats, power windows, including power wing windows, cruise control, tilt wheel, as well as the 428 cubic inch Super Marauder V8, among other items. Perhaps because of its lofty base price, or even because the Cougar was selling so well in Mercury showrooms, the 1967 marquee really just never made a dent in terms of sales. The production year ended at 6,510 units. Ford must have thought that part of this low production figure was due to the lofty base price because in 1968 they dropped the base price from the $3,989 down about $300 to $3,685. This 1968 marquee is one of my favorites ever and I'm thankful that I've been able to own one for the last three or four years because the production on the 1968 model year was even less than 1967 at just 3,965 units. 1968 was also the last year before the Park Lane name would be Sunset and the marquee would basically become Mercury's full-size car with variants in two-doors, four-door sedans, as well as four-door hardtops, which was not true for 1967 and 68 when the marquee denoted a high-end coupe only. The 69 and 70 marquees introduced a really interesting rectilinear front end with hidden headlights that was a marked departure from the 1967 and 68 model years, but equally handsome and equally, if I may say, masculine in form. And the front end of the 69 would really set the tone of the full-size Mercuries until they were retired and downsized after 1978. So we've been talking about the marquee. Where did the Grand Marquee come into play? Well, the Grand Marquee was first offered as an optional interior package on the Marquee Bromes in 1974. You can see here that the Marquee Bromes came with a brocade cloth or vinyl trim, whereas the Grand Marquees have a distinct and unique seat pattern that launched in 1974 and would carry through all the way until 1978, the last year of the full-size vehicle. The Grand Marquis was thus the range-topping Mercury of the time in trim, and as I mentioned, it was a further option beyond the Marquis Brome. Personally, I actually like the Marquis Brome interior better than the Grand Marquis, as the Grand Marquis, in particular the door panels and the seat pattern, just don't look more expensive to me than the Marquis Brome, although they certainly were priced that way. Nonetheless, the Grand Marquis trim remained just that, a high-level trim on the Marquis until the end of the 1982 model year, and in 1983 it became its own standalone model, which it continued that way until the car ended production in 2011. So what's it like to own one of these marquees from the early years before they were called the Grand Marquis as a standalone model? Well, like any of the full-size Mercuries from the late 60s and early 70s, I can say that if you can find one, you certainly will not regret picking one up and enjoying it for yourself. Either a marquee or a marquee brome or a Grand Marquis. All of them are significantly substantial vehicles that are well-built and they're not just tarted up Fords. Mercury really was trying to live in the Lincoln Continental tradition and sold that not only as a marketing slogan, but also really lived it in the cars that they engineered. These vehicles ride extremely smoothly, are very comfortable, have extra sound deadening versus the Ford counterparts, are longer in wheelbase, and provide a, sub a sublime ride for anything around town or cross country. In fact, I would say the rides in these vehicles from the late 60s to early 70s were the best around, even beyond the Lincolns. And if you find one, they are rare as hen's teeth today, but I suggest that you snap it up if you're looking at a classic car at a reasonable price point because you will really enjoy these vehicles. I know I have. 
Additionally, often because Mercuries are less well-known than the Ford counterparts, you can get a Mercury with a great engine like a 390, a 410, or 428 and pay just a fraction of what you would if that were in a contemporaneous Ford model like a Galaxy 7 liter. So why not get the upper-end trim and a handsome vehicle at that, the Mercury and Mercury Marquis? Hope you enjoyed this little vignette on the origins of the Mercury Marquis. Thanks again for watching. Thank you for watching this video on the origins of the Mercury Marquis and Grand Marquis name. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and if you did, please like and comment as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve this video up to more people like you. And if you haven't yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Click the icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left. And then also check out two videos that are suggested for you by YouTube in the thumbnails at the bottom left and right. Until the next time, thanks again for watching and take care.